Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Barry Erickson, and I am Community Engagement Coordinator at Wheaton Public Library. Tonight, we are proud to bring you another session of our ACES series. The ACES or Aging and Caregiving Engagement and Support series is designed for all seniors and caregivers. We wanna help our community members live comfortably and stress-free at every age. Many of us are concerned about the predicted rise in utility prices. Tonight's ACES program on curbing utility costs features Cynthia Segura, a sustainable communities liaison with the Citizens Utility Board, otherwise known as CUB. As part of their outreach team, Cynthia is here to provide information about how to reduce our energy usage this winter. She will help us better understand the ins and outs of our bills, avoid utility scams, and access programs designed to save us money and energy. So with so much great information to provide, I'm anxious to turn the screen over to you, Cynthia. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much, Barry. I appreciate everyone being here, especially after hearing all the fun recordings that you have available to you through the library. I am no professional baker, but hopefully um, <laughs> I uh, this is useful information. So I have that. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me know if you can't see my screen, but it should be sharing. All right. Um, good. Okay, great. Thank you. Like Barry said, my name is Cynthia Segura and I'm with the Citizens Utility Board. And today we'll be talking about all things utility related on understanding your bills, on different programs available to you, how to save energy and money as well. Um, but before we get started, I thought I would do a little bit of a briefer on what Citizens Utility Board is and why you guys should remember us. So CUB was started in the early 1980s by an act of the Illinois General Assembly. Uh, we are not actually a part of state government, but we do have the state mandated mission, which is to represent the interests of state regulated utility ratepayers. So this means that we advocate for consumers throughout the state in different levels of utility oversight. And we also do a lot of uh, consumer advocacy through um, education and outreach. So like I said, we are a part of different levels of utility oversight. We work with regulatory matters before the Illinois Commerce Commission, which is the state regulatory body that oversees utilities. We work before the Illinois General Assembly when we fight for stronger consumer protections and legislation. Uh, we have lobbyists down in Springfield and then occasionally we do get involved with litigation before the courts. And that has to do with you know, securing customer refunds or intervening in rate hike cases as well. Um, and then, like I just mentioned, we do have an outreach team, which is the team I'm a part of. And you know, prior to the pandemic, we would drive all over the state giving presentations and helping with utility bill consultations. Um, and you know, now we do this somewhat of a hybrid format, um, but we do a lot of outreach, which are a lot of direct consumer facing uh, programs or um, events where we educate consumers about all things utility related. So, you know, reading your bills, alternative suppliers, energy efficiency, solar solar, telecom, all of that good stuff. Um, and then we also do a, a service called a utility bill consultation, where we'll sit down with an individual um, and actually look at their bills. And it, we're able to, to individually recommend certain programs or ways to save money on their utilities as well. I also did want to quickly plug a few of our virtual services that could be of interest to some of you folks. Um, the first being our website, citizensutilityboard.org. It hosts a lot of great fact sheets and guides on just about anything utility related. Um, and so that has to do with gas, electric, telecom, and then a little bit of water as well. Um, so if you have any sort of, you know, utility question or you're, you know, itching to learn more about something, chances are we do have a fact sheet on it. Um, and then we also do have a consumer advocacy hotline that consumers can call during business hours. If you ever had any sort of utility related problem or question, uh, we have consumer rights counselors who can, you know, help, um, you know, tell you your rights under state law. We can uh, file a complaint to that utility on your behalf, or we can, you know, direct you to a certain program or how to apply to a certain, you know, resource or something to that extent. Um, and in certain cases we, cases, we can get in touch with a higher office at that utility and host a three-way call uh, to troubleshoot that issue. <clears throat> um, and then all we also have, excuse me, <clears throat> We also do have a service, like I mentioned, a, a utility bill consultation. Well, prior to the pandemic, we would do those in person and it would typically be hosted with an organization. Uh, but due to COVID, we have 
you know, um, transition to an online platform as well. So we have been doing some in-person utility bill consultations and those are still available, but now we have a more uh, readily available stream to participate in that. Meaning that if you can, if you would like to participate in that, you can simply email your bills to that email address right there, ubc at citizensutilityboard.org. And a CUB staff member will actually reach out and we'll either schedule a video call or a phone call, or you know, we can email you an analysis depending on your preference. Um, and we'll basically walk through your bills with you so that you can learn how to understand them, um, how to spot billing errors or scams, and then offer some individual recommendations as to ways to save money um, on your utilities. And like I mentioned, you can, um, if you were interested in participating in that, you would simply email your bills to that address. All right, now getting into the meat of the presentation here. Um, so we'll kick things off with starting on um, electric bills and then we'll switch to gas bills. Um, and then we'll go ahead and talk about um, reducing energy costs and energy as a whole, as well as different resources. So in Illinois, we have what's called electric supply choice. So this means that we can choose who is supplying our electricity. Now, this is different than delivery because, um, you know, ComEd does, uh, is in charge of the delivery of our electricity. And in that case, we do not have an option. ComEd actually owns the lines that, you know, that, that transfer the electricity to your home. Um, so we can actually, we, we cannot actually choose our delivery service. We are with ComEd, but we can choose who we uh, get our supply from. So um, in Illinois, we do have different choices. Uh, generally, there are two choices, but there are there is a third choice um, for certain municipalities that participate in municipal aggregation, uh, which, which I should mention that Wheaton does not participate in municipal ag aggregation at this time, um, so I won't go into too much deal, detail on that. Um, but our first choice is the ComEd supply or the default electric utility supply. Um, so this is a regulated rate. It is a rate that is set by the Illinois Power Agency and it is passed through to consumers at no charge, which means that ComEd actually doesn't make money off of the supply side of your bill. And this applies to all utilities as well state regulated utilities concerning gas and electric. Um, but that's, that being said, that rate is a state regulated rate. Or you can be with an alternative supplier. Um, and this is much of what you imagine, those door-to-door -door solicitations or somebody tabling at a farmer's market or a grocery store. Or the other day or the other week, I actually saw one at the airport. So they are quite literally everywhere. Um, but these alternative suppliers, are. Uh, basically supply electricity um, and that rate, if you are with an alternative supplier, that rate is actually not state regulated like the default utility supply rate is. Um, so that alternative supplier can charge you whatever they would like for your electric supply. Um, and that's a bit of a background as to the choices there, but like I mentioned, there is a third choice for those municipalities that do offer municipal aggregation, uh, which is simply when a municipality negotiates with an alternative supplier to offer their residents a, a deal with their alternative supplier. Um, this is not necessarily a good or bad thing in terms of price, meaning that each alternative supplier, or sorry, each municipal aggregation deal is dependent on the municipality. So it can be cheaper, it can't it can be not cheaper uh, or more expensive. So if um, you know you hear someone talking about municipal aggregation or if they're concerned, um, that is on a you know by municipality case basis. So um, just a little bit of some words of caution on alternative suppliers here. Um, like I mentioned, they uh, they're. There are door-to-door -door solicitations as well as tabling at different, you know, events. Um, and I should mention that door-to-door -door more or the door-to-door -door moratorium on solicitations for alternative suppliers has recently been lifted. Um, so you may be starting to experience more of that door-to-door -door solicitation possibly. Um, and if that is the case, uh, just be very careful. Um, make sure to not show any sort of salesperson your utility bill or your account number, um, and just be cognizant of the kind of information that you share with them. And if you are weary of an alternative supplier, it's for a good reason, because it is very rare that an alternative supplier has a better deal than the default utility supply. All right, so when it comes to saving energy, what, what can you do? Well, the first important step here is to make sure that you understand your utility bills and you understand, you know, things like the supply issue there and how that works. 
And this is because, you know, you don't want to be pouring money into something that is not giving you any sort of additional benefit. So it also does, um, um, it is also a benefit to read about the current price of electricity or gas on your bill and to stay up to date on that as well. Um, and so we can start by actually checking if you are with an alternative supplier, which I will show you how to do on these next slides. So right here, we are looking at an electric bill and, and electric bills are split into three portions. So we have supply, we have delivery, and we have taxes and fees. And like I mentioned, we do have electric supply choice. So this, consumer's, uh, this consumer is on an alternative supplier that happens to be called Dynegy Energy Services. So if you were on the default utility supply, it would say ComEd provides your energy. And I will show you on the next slide um, how to exactly check that rate that you're being charged with that alternative supplier. Uh, but just so you know, that is the, the supply section of your bill and that's the easiest way to kind of tell if you are with an alternative supplier is to check that bottom left corner of the first page there. The second thing that I typically look for when I'm looking at people's um, or an individual's um, utility bill is I'll look at this um, usage trend chart over here. So if you're, you know, doing this long enough, it's easy to kind of sense the usage and, you know, connect it to the, to the age of the home or the, the, the um, you know, behavior habits and whatnot. Um, but typically when I receive a bill and I'm looking at the usage trend, I will go ahead and start asking questions um, about, you know, appliances, about the age of the home, maybe the size of the family or behavior as well. Um, and this is because, you know, if we see a weird trend, we like to get to the bottom of it. And so I keep asking those kinds of questions in order to kind of get to that bottom of that, you know, if there is a weird trend here. Um, in the Midwest, or we, since we are in the Midwest and most homes in the Midwest use gas to heat their homes, if we're looking at an electric bill, we'll typically see a spike in the summer months, and then we'll see it usually dip down in the winter months. Um, and that's because in the summer, people are using AC to uh, cool their homes and in the winter, you know, ACs are not running. Um, so if I were to receive a bill, the second thing I look at is that usage trend chart. And of course, um, like I mentioned, this is not actually individualized. So if you were, or I encourage everyone here to participate in our utility bill consultation, where we'll actually individually look at your bill and analyze your bill on, you know, an individual level here. All right. So now we're looking at the second page of the bill here. Um, oh, whoops, I want to, let's see. Okay, sorry, I kind of misordered the transitions there. Um, but so like I mentioned, we are going to check, you know, the rate that the alternative supplier is charging this consumer. So you can go to the second page of your bill and you can actually look under this supply section right here. So it says supply and then it says the alternative supplier. To check the rate, you would actually look right down below that. It'll say energy charge, and it'll say a number of kilowatt hours they use that month times a number. Currently, the ComEd um, electric rate is at 7.7 .7 cents um, per kilowatt hour. And at that time, it was a little bit lower. Um, but this is where you would find the rate that alternative supplier is charging. And then to check the the um, default utility supply rate, you can actually look at the right hand side of your bill. There'll be a price to compare section right here, like I highlighted, and it'll actually say that the, you know, the ComEd electric supply price is this. So you have the alternative supplier um, rate on the left and then the default utility supply on the right. Um, and then, you know, most likely the um, alternative supplier is charging more. And in that case, I would recommend canceling. And in order to cancel with an alternative supplier, you would look at the front page of, the, of your electric bill. There'll actually be a number right under that supply section that I highlighted on the last slide. Um, and that's the number you would call. Um, and, you know, if you, if you were to cancel, you would see that on your bill um, after one to two billing cycles, and you would be automatically shifted back to the ComEd default supply, um, just as a little bit of a disclaimer there. But um, that's how you kind of check the um, alternative supplier rate to the default ComEd supply rate. Um, but if anyone has any questions on that, or is, you know, has any sort of difficulty reading that ComEd, or sorry, CUB regularly posts the electric, the current electric and gas rates as well. If that is helpful, you can check our website for that. Um, and then the third thing I'll look for is this meter information right here. Um, you can't really see it too well, but this meter number for this consumer actually starts with a two. Um, and that simply means that this consumer has a spark meter 
Uh, most homes throughout the state already do have a smart meter by now, but it's just something I like to point out because it makes consumers eligible for some of the demand response or energy efficiency programs um, that I'll talk about later on in the uh, presentation. So the th first three, the first thing I look at is who is supplying your electricity. The second thing I look at is that usage trend chart. And the third thing is typically that smart meter number. All right, now we're switching over to the gas side of things. Um, and a very similar concepts apply to the gas side of um, your utilities here. The only difference is that there are not really any sort of municipal aggregation deals with gas that I talked about earlier. Um, but with gas, we do have a gas supply choice as well. So we can either be with an alternative supplier or we can be on the default gas utility as well or either or, I'm sorry. Um, and the default gas utility for a lot of uh, the Chicago suburbs is NICOR gas. And the same concept applies where we can't choose the delivery of our utility or of our gas since NICOR actually owns the lines, the, the gas lines. And a very similar trend applies to the gas side of things as well. Um, so the first thing I'll point out is that alternative supplier issue. So if you're looking at a NICOR bill, you can actually look at the total additional products and services section of your bill. And you'll see at this bottom part here, it says IGS energy uh, uh, questions, please call this number. IGS energy is an alternative supplier. And that rate that that consumer is being charged is right over here. If you can see that right there, it's in this, um, the line charges, if that makes sense. And then you can also find that under a message for you box, which is right above that total additional, additional products and services as well. It'll typically also highlight any sort of financial assistance, but then right below that, it'll say your customer select supplier is blank. Here's a number. And then um, the same exact concept applies that if you wanted to cancel with an alternative supplier, then you would call that number um, and they would cancel you and you could, and you would be shifted back to the default night course supply. And then the second thing I look for is this usage trend as well. Um, this is pretty typical of what we see in homes in the Midwest since, like I mentioned, most homes do use gas to heat their homes. So we'll see a spike in the winter months and then a dip down in the summer months. I guess it's inverted from what we see in the on the electric side of things. All right, um, and then quickly I'll highlight um, a huge win for us consumer advocates and just consumers as a whole when it comes to alternative suppliers and consumer protections. Um, and that's the HEAT Act, which is the Home Energy Affordability and Transparency Act. Um, so this took effect into, in 2020, so it's somewhat recent. Um, but this piece of legislation just gave the um, Illinois Commerce Commission, which is the state regulatory body that oversees utilities, it gave the ICC, um, the Illinois Commerce Commission, sharper teeth when dealing with alternative suppliers. So it ended early termination and exit fees, uh, which was a huge deal because a lot of people would be on these alternative supplier plans in which you would have to pay money to actually get off of and they were being overcharged. So that presented a huge consumer protection issue where you know maybe somebody enrolls thinking they have a very good fixed rate and then somehow it escalates later on and or it changes to a variable rate and they're paying more. Um, it also stops suppliers from automatically renewing a contract from a fixed rate from, uh, to a higher cost variable rate like I just mentioned. Um, it also gave the um, marketing materials for alternative suppliers more strict guidelines when it came to, you know, distribution of the, the, the marketing and um, selling the alternative supplier deals to consumers. Um, and then it also made sure that there are clear utility current prices on your electric bill. So like I showed the price to compare section on your comment bill, that's due to the HEAT Act. Uh, and this all this is also super important that the HEAT Act protects um, low-income um, families from being uh, exploited by alternative suppliers. And this is through the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. I'll talk about this later on, but it is a program in which people receive utility assistance. Um, and the HEAT Act prevents people that are receiving this utility assistance to be enrolled with alternative suppliers unless that alternative supplier offers a savings guarantee uh, for that consumer. Alrighty, and next we're uh, kind of venturing off into the actual saving uh, um, energy part of your uh, part of the presentation here. Um, and which I'd like to say that energy efficiency is 
the unsung hero. We always say this at Cub, the cheapest energy is the energy that you don't use. It is cheaper to reduce your load through energy efficiency than to, you know, um, than to, than to maybe like generate solar or something to that extent. Um, it's always cheapest to reduce your energy first. Um, and so like that second bullet there says 15% of your electric bill is lighting. So it's really important that you're switching over to LED light bulbs and efficient lighting. It's also important to make sure that you're aware of what's called vampire electric power. Um, so this is when you have maybe an entertainment system plugged in or a bunch of things plugged in and maybe they're the actual, you know, um, like product is off, um, but they're still using a little bit of electricity. So it's really important to be mindful of what you have actually plugged into your home. Um, and like I mentioned, or like that slide says, 23% of power consumption, or vampire power is a part of 23% of power consumption within an average household. So that's important to, you know, look into things like power, um, smart power strips, which can actually reduce the amount of electricity that's being sucked away from things that are actually turned off. All right, um, and then when it comes to efficiency and savings, like I mentioned for light bulbs, it's really important to uh, be mindful of, you know, what kind of light bulb are you using? Is it LED? Is it CFL? Um, and just know that um, LED light bulbs use 75% less energy than incandescent light bulbs. Um, and it's also important to make sure that you know, if you're considering appli or new appliances or if you're ever on the market for appliances that you're looking into Energy Star, um, energy efficient appliances that use less energy. Uh, and it's also important to check your, thermo or your thermostat and utilize that technology to your advantage. So if you have uh, a smart th or a thermostat to make sure that you're using the e eco mode or lowering down the temperature if you're not home, which is the beauty of that technology is that if you're not home and you forgot to change th the temperature, you can do it from your smart device. Um, so it's a great way to regulate the temperature within your home. Right. And then uh, when it comes to water, it's really important to use low flow shower heads and faucet aerators, which I'll talk about in the next slide, um, a program that allows ratepayers to access those free energy saving products. Um, and another tip, which I actually hadn't heard of, um, you know, prior to working here at Cub, is that if you have access to your hot water heater, you can actually change the setting from the default setting, which is, uh, the default setting is typically 140 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but you can actually lower that to a warmer, to a warm setting, which is typically around 120 degrees, and most people find plenty sufficient. Um, so that saves um, that saves, saves energy in the heating of, uh, of that water. And it, it, you know, um, it's just a cool tip that I actually had no idea. Unfortunately, I can't do that because I don't have access to my um, hot water heater. But if I did, I would go ahead and do that. Um, and then, you know, obviously making sure that when you're running any sort of appliance like washer, your, uh, your, your dishwasher, your laundry, or, you know, washing machine or whatnot, make sure that those loads are actually full uh, when you go ahead and cycle those on. All right, so there is a way for people to access, um, you know, some of these energy saving products. Um, as rate payers, we pay into uh, energy efficiency programs for both of our utilities and ComEd and NICOR, um, or whichever gas utility um, you are a consumer of, um, actually provide a program called Home Energy Assessment. It is free to us rate payers um, where we actually receive personalized energy, uh, a personalized energy assessment with free installation of energy saving products. So that includes things like programmable thermostats, LED light bulbs, faucet aerators, hot water pipe insulation, um, and then low flow high pressure shower heads as well. And you can um, purchase a smart, a smart thermostat as well as a smart power strip um, at a discount through this program as well. Oh, and I'd like to mention that um, currently it's done in a hybrid format where um, you can either have somebody, somebody come into your home and actually, um, you know, um, um, actually install these, uh, these energy saving products, or you can have this done virtually well, where they will actually mail you these um, products and they'll actually go through on how to actually, um, you know, install them virtually on a, on a video platform. All right. Um, I can go into demand response programs. I just wanted to stop for a second and see if we had any questions because I cannot actually see the, the Q&A box. Oops. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, I, 
this is a great time just just remind people about that Q and A box. And uh, if we can just circle back for for a moment, uh, can you confirm that if uh, a customer is on the alternative supplier and they decide that they want to go to you know ComEd or NICOR, all they have to do is contact the alternative supplier to cancel. They don't have to start start the contract or start the the customer relationship with Comet or NICOR, they don't have that second step? That's a great question. Yeah, um, exactly. So as a consumer, if you would like to be, if you were on an alternative supplier and you'd like to be shifted back to the Comet or NICOR supply, all you have to do is cancel with that alternative supplier and let them know that. Um, and then you will, you know, like I mentioned, it'll take one to two billing cycles to actually see that on your bill, um, but you would be automatically shifted back to that default supply. Um, and I will mention here that if this were the case with anybody or if you hear this and if any sort of alternative supplier gives you any sort of hard time with canceling with them, uh, please do not hesitate to call the CUP hotline. That's what we're here for and we can help you out with that. Great, great, thank you. And one more thing, like for instance, if, if one of, um, if a customer wants to uh, get some LED bulbs, for instance, how how do you get those from ComEd? Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, so it depends on if you're looking just for LED light bulbs, um, you can actually go to the ComEd Marketplace website. If you Google ComEd Marketplace, um, you can actually order them online and that's with the instant rebate actually accounted for. Um, and then also, if you were looking for other energy saving products, you could actually um, enroll with the um, home energy assessment, which is like I mentioned, is a free program available to us, rate payers free program, um, which includes all of these energy saving products at no additional cost. So um, it depends on kind of if you want just the light bulbs or if you would like the whole, you know, free energy saving products kit kind of deal there. Right. So that and that website is would be on our bill. Or Sorry, no. the, the, oh. the website too. Oh, the marketplace website. I don't believe it is on the bill. It might be. I'm not 100% sure, but you can Google the ComEd marketplace and it will pop up. Or if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to me and I can direct you to the website as well. That sounds great. That's great. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. So uh, why don't you go ahead? All right. Carrying on here, we'll go into demand response programs, which are very, very cool. Um, and one of my favorite topics to talk about here at Cub. Um, so the whole entire premise of a demand response program is to incentivize people to use electricity during non-peak times. Um, so when I say peak time, that means that, you know, a lot of people are maybe coming home and using electricity or um, there's a strain on the grid due to an increase in demand for electricity. So demand response programs allow consumers to be flexible with their usage and can overall reduce energy consumption. And this is by, like I mentioned, incentivizing people to use electricity during non-peak times to flatten out those peak times. Um, so this ensures that there's enough energy on the grid to supply all of us um, Illinois consumers. And that's because when we have a huge demand, we have to actually, you know, kick in fire or coal fired generators coal-fired power generators to actually meet our higher demands. Um, and so certain programs that cover or fall within this demand response program category include peak time savings, central AC cycling, and hourly pricing. Okay, so I'll start with the summer programs first. I know we are in the winter and this is more geared towards saving for the winter, um, but you know, when summer does roll around, this can be a, a good way to save a few bucks. Um, so the first program is peak time savings, and this is always categorized as, or marketed as a all carrots, no stick kind of program because it really cannot hurt to be on this program. Um, so anybody is eligible to be on peak time savings. So whether you're a renter or a homeowner or whatnot, um, you can enroll with peak time savings. What happens is if we are expected or if ComEd projects us to be having a, um, a peak time or you know, an increase in demand for electricity, they'll send out a text, call, or email to their peak time savings participants saying, you know, this is the, these are the hours of a peak time event. If you save electricity during this peak time, um, you can actually save a little bit of money on your bill. Currently, it's at um, $1 for every kilowatt hour saved, and this is relative to your normal usage. Um, and typically, they'll call you know, three to five events throughout the summer. 
Um, so like I mentioned, uh, this is a great program because if you manage to save electricity, um, then you can save a little bit of money. But if you don't, then nothing happens. Um, and the way that you actually get you know, credited for that is actually through your bill. So you're not going to actually get a check in the mail from ComEd or anything, but you'll actually just see it on your electric bill. It'll say um, a little, it'll show the credit on your bill, I should say. Um, and then we also do have central AC cycling, which is a program where ComEd actually installs a device on your central AC system that cycles on and off your compressor, but the fan does stay on. Um, and this, they only do that during, um, you know, uh, events that they call special, you know, relative to the central AC cycling program. Um, I do want to mention that this program is only for homeowners with central AC systems. Uh, so unfortunately, the, the eligibility, you know, guidelines are a little bit more strict with AC cycling. Um, but this is more of a sure way of, you know, saving a bit, bit, bit of money because you can actually get that money prorated on your bill. So you would receive a 20 to $40 credit on your bill, depending on which cycle option you choose. Um, and, you know, the comment is pretty conservative as to when they call those central AC cycling events. Um, I've talked to a lot of consumers on central AC cycling, and I swear all of them are always like, oh, yeah, I forgot I was on that program. They don't even notice that they're on um, central AC cycling. Um, I also do want to note that you cannot be on peak time savings and central AC cycling at the same time. Those are actually not compatible with each other. Okay, um, and then this is a program called hourly pricing. This is available all year round. So those two programs that I just mentioned are mostly relevant in the summer, um, but hourly pricing is relevant and available all year round. Um, so what happens with hourly pricing is that you are not actually paying a flat rate for your electric supply. So as traditional customers, we pay that flat electric supply cost, right? So currently it's at 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour, which means that, you know, it costs the same to use electricity, whether we use it at 7 p.m. or, you know, 5 a.m. Um, with hourly pricing, you're actually paying a market rate. So that is a rate that changes by the hour, depending on demand for electricity at that time. So um, there is a little bit more of, of inconsistency with what you're paying, meaning that you have um, you can actually check the ComEd website and check the projected prices, um, but it's not always a flat rate, like I mentioned. It's actually not a flat rate at all, but um, I'll go ahead and show you some of those, the, the projections there. Um, but I just wanted to say that, you know, overall, the hourly pricing um, rate actually tends to be lower than that traditional ComEd default rate. And that's why hourly pricing can be a good, um, a, a, can be a good option for people. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to look at a little bit more of a micro scale here. This is a usage um, trend of a certain day of one of my colleagues here at Cub. So, you know, maybe we're just looking at a general profile here. Maybe, you know, you're making breakfast in the morning or running the dishwasher during lunchtime or, you know, um, using the toaster oven to make dinner. Um, so these are all, you know, at a micro level, this is what people may be using their electricity um, during the day. But on a macro scale, this can create strain on the grid. Um, maybe people are coming home and making dinner after work. Um, you know, the, and when we do uh, have an increase in demand, like I mentioned, we do have to use additional sources to meet our electricity demand. Uh, and those tend to be the dirtiest, uh, or the, that tends to be the dirtiest energy that we use is those peaker, um, peaker plants is what we typically call them. Um, so that's why hourly pricing can be a great program just uh, for the environmental benefits it brings as well. Um, and like I mentioned, the rate does tend to be uh, a, lot of, a lot of times of, of the day, the, that hourly pricing rate does tend to be lower than the default ComEd supply rate, leading uh, people to actually save money on hourly pricing. Um, I'll say that the, 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 savings the savings is not actually guaranteed, so it's best to actually um, possibly consult ComEd by live chatting them on their website or giving them a call um, to see more about your savings prospects on hourly pricing. Um, and then I also did want to mention like on this on this slide here, you can see um, you can actually check the projected prices um, for a certain day and you know certain time. So you can see that these these blue, this blue line right here, this is the day ahead projected price for hourly pricing. And then this red here is the, the real time. 
So you can see that, you know, let's see, this was in August, the, the cost for electricity supply was around seven cents. So you can see that for most of the day, the actual cost for hourly pricing, the hourly pricing rate was a lot lower than the default comment supply. So, um, and like I mentioned, it's it's great if you were you know curious about your savings prospect to cost to contact the hourly pricing folks at ComEd and um, you know see more about that because it actually is dependent on an individual's capacity charge and their own behavior as well. So. Okay, I do see we have something in the chat. I want to see if that's a question. Oh, never mind. Thank you, Barry, for putting the, the marketplace website in the chat. Okay, um, so then when it comes to, you know, keeping the air in your home warm and then keeping the cool out, the cool air out, it's really important to make sure that you're adopting energy efficiency and weatherization um, actions in your home. So like I mentioned, weatherization um, is super important because you're, you know, you're not saving or you're not using that extra energy to, you know, heat more air than you actually need, that you're actually keeping that warm, warm air in and you're, um, you know, leaving that cool air outside. So that has to do with air sealing around your windows and your doors. That's a great place to start when you're looking at um, places that are, you know, creating the most draft within your home. Um, it's also important to use caulk or weather stripping to seal off drafty areas in your home. Um, so making sure that you are, um, you know, doing these um, smaller home energy projects that, you know, may, may, may that may not sound like a lot, but they do add up. And not only will they save you a little bit of money, but they will make your home more comfortable, which is ultimately very important, obviously. Um, and then when it comes to, you know, air systems to make sure that you're cleaning or replacing any sort of filters for your for forced air heating system every month or so. Um, and so this would help to avoid blocking ventilation. So um, you don't want to over overwork your system if there's a huge film of dust on your filters. Um, it really does nothing but waste energy and money. So and then I'll also say that you might want to actually replace or clean those out a little bit more often if you have pets, uh, those, those hairs, they can be everywhere. So, um, and like I mentioned, um, you don't want to overheat your, uh, you don't want to overwork your heating system. Um, so closing your blinds or covering windows can actually add an extra layer of protection against the wind um, and your windows. So I use, you know, blinds or making sure that, you know, maybe you have a curtain or some, um, of some sort acts as another layer of, of protection. Um, or another option is to install, you know, shrink to fit plastic around your windows. I actually had one sitting right next to me. I, I'm planning to do that um, on my windows this weekend, actually. Um, and then when it comes to setting your thermostat, it's recommended that you typically set your thermostat for around 68 degrees when you're home and awake. And that if you, you know, were to, you know, in, when you're sleeping, you can actually turn it a little bit lower um, to save more money if you would like as well. Um, and then as most people probably know by now, um, it's really important that you never set your thermostat to below 55 degrees. Um, and this is because, you know, we're in the Midwest. You don't want your, your pipes to freeze. Um, so it's important to, to make sure that you're, you know, not setting your thermostat below 55. Okay, um, so when it comes to financial assistance, uh, a lot of this information is extremely important, especially this time of year round, especially this year, given the higher gas prices. Um, so when it comes to financial assistance, it's always important to first start out by content, get contact, contacting your utility company in question. Um, and this is because you know, if once when you are a connected consumer, you have certain consumer protections um, that, you know, if it came to a disconnection and if you were disconnected, that some of those consumer protections do not carry through. So, uh, and when you contact your utility, they can help with any sort of uh, billing arrangement. They can help um, possibly put you on a deferred payment arrangement, uh, which is basically uh, a an option for those who have arrearages where you can actually pay a certain amount in a down payment and then pay the rest of your debt in monthly installments within four to 12 months um, and you know work work your way down that debt that way. Um, but that is only available by you know calling your utility and talking to them. So if you do or if you are in need of financial assistance or you do have an arrearage, uh, please contact your utility first. 
Um, and I will also talk about LIHEAP, which is the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. It is not the only form of utility assistance, but it is a major form of utility assistance throughout the state. Uh, LIHEAP is a program that is run statewide and it's administered by the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Um, and so LIHEAP applications are currently open up until May 31st or when funding is exhausted. So it's uh, really important to know, like if you are in need of financial assistance for utilities um, that you apply sooner rather than later um, because that, that funding or that those applications are open until funding is exhausted. Um, and to learn more about LIHEAP, you can visit helpillinoisfamilies.com, which is a, uh, a website that the Illinois uh, DCEO actually started for utility assistance as well as other forms of assistance, but um, you can find more information on LIHEAP that way. Um, to apply, you can either submit a request for services on that Help Illinois Families website, or you can apply um, directly with your local LIHEAP administering agency uh, for Wheaton and the rest of DuPage. It is the DuPage County Community Services. I did insert that number there, uh, but you can always uh, check their website. They do have emails and um, uh, they do have an email uh, available as well and an office, um, but I would recommend by starting, you know, calling that number if you were in need. Okay, um, and like I mentioned, LIHEAP is not the only form of utility assistance throughout the state. Utilities also do offer utility assistance as well. So ComEd and NICOR do have payment assistance programs. Uh, ComEd has a residential hardship program as well as CHAMP, which is a program for um, you know, veterans. Um, I will say but the funding for both of those programs has run out this year, um, so those unfortunately are not readily available, uh, but there is the NICOR sharing program that is for, you know, your gas utility um, that is available through your actual lo local Salvation Army office, um, so if you're interested in that, you can actually visit your local Salvation Army and talk to them about the NICOR sharing program. Um, I also wanted to highlight the Illinois Home Weatherization Program uh, or, live, or I, IWAP. There's all these different acronyms, um, but IWAP is a program that is also for income qualified individuals. It has the same income qualifications as LIHEAP, um, which is at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, but IWAP helps with installing and adopting energy efficiency and weatherization services or, um, in your home. So it helps low-income individuals or households conserve fuel and uh, reduce energy costs. So this has to do with air sealing, there's furnace replacement or repair, um, there's a little bit of health and safety funding as well. Um, um, so that is another possible avenue to weatherize your home, and it offers up to fifteen uh, thousand dollars of grants for you know weatherization services. Um, and then, you know, besides utility programs and, um, you know, the, the state DCO programs, um, similar to United Way, like I mentioned, Salvation Army also does run a number of neighborhood-based uh, programs. Um, Salvation Army, like I also mentioned, does administer that NICOR sharing program. Um, local churches and nonprofit entities also help provide services and support as well. And if you have any sort of questions in accessing sort of any sort of uh, financial assistance or uh, financial assistance, then please do call the CUP hotline. Uh, we can help direct people as to, you know, what might be the most uh, or the best fit for, you know, financial assistance or most readily available financial assistance for you. And then this is actually the last slide of information I have here. I did want to quickly talk about the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, which is a really piece, a really exciting piece of legislation that recently passed in September of this year. Um, and you know, this is a comprehensive, you know, 900 plus page energy bill. Uh, so I can't really do it too much justice in one slide, uh, but I'll kind of highlight some of the main not even Maine, I'm scratching the surface when it comes to this bill. There is just a lot um, that it changes within our energy system. Um, so first it actually sets Illinois on a path to achieve 100% carbon free power sector by 2045. So this means that by 2030, uh, private coal and oil fired power plants would be eliminated uh, with, uh, re with pollution reduction targets on the municipally owned 
plants up until that deadline. And there is a priority for the plants closest in proximity to environmental justice communities to be um, shut down first. So it's not you know, on a basis of economics, it's on a basis of proximity as well as some other factors. Um, it expands our renewable energy goals as a state. So we have what's called the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which is a percentage of a uh, set percentage of renewable generation by a certain year. So previously it was set at 25% renewable generation by 2025. And now it's currently set at 40% by 2050. So we you know, had ambitious goals and now we have even more ambitious goals and we need ways to you know, make those goals. Um, and so CJA, the Climate Equitable Jobs Act actually expands our solar incentive program in the state called Illinois Shines which was uh, previously on pause, but now is, is reopened um, to the public. And that had to do with funds that, and the way that the Future Energy Jobs Act or legislation prior to CJA was written. Um, but now we have these more ambitious goals and we're expanding our, our state and solar incentive program. Um, CJA also increases our budget for solar, Illinois Solar for All, which is an income qualified solar program. Uh, so previously it was set at $11 million per year and now it's set at $50 million per year per year. So hopefully, you know, that provides a lot more access to solar for in, in, all, in, Ill, all Illinoisans across the state. Um, CJA, it is called the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, so there are a lot of provisions and expansion on workforce development. Um, over $80 million is allocated per year for workforce and contractor development programs. So there's different programs like creating hubs throughout the state where people can have training on clean energy um, jobs, as well as, you know, different mentorship programs for contractors. And there's just a ton of uh, opportunity with, with workforce and development under CJA. Um, CJA also ends formula rate making. This is super exciting as a consumer advocate, as a consumer advocate. So formula rate making is a way that, um, that utilities were able to increase their, 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 you know, delivery fees. Um, and this was a little bit more of an opaque process. Um, and now it's changing to a performance-based process where um, a utility compensation is going to be tied to a set of metrics, um, which are not 100%, you know, set in stone yet, but has to do with consumer, you know, customer support, reliability, resilience, um, interconnection timing, all of these great, uh, all these different metrics that are going to determine the utility compensation. So they actually have to perform well to get paid or more, I suppose. Um, and then it also expands on a lot of transportation initiatives as, as well um, as, you know, this overarching goal of a million EVs in Illinois by tw uh, 2030. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, and I don't want to ramble anymore about CJA. Um, but if you guys have any sort of questions on that, I am always more than available to talk. I love um, talking to consumers about anything, you know, utility related. Um, so if you have any sort of questions, here's my email and here's the Cobb hotline as well. I do see we have a question in the Q&A. Yes, Cynthia, um, someone mentions that they had been part of the, they've been part of the hourly pricing program for several years and, and over the course of that time saved hundreds of dollars, mm -hmm. uh, but not this year. Uh, and they're, so they're wondering why that change may have occurred, if it's temporary or if maybe they should return to flat rate. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we have heard that a lot from consumers this year, and that has to do with the fact that there have just been a lot of, um, you know, hot summer days uh, and a lot of increases in electricity demand, which has led to, you know, increased prices for electricity. Um, so unfortunately, that, that, yeah, like you mentioned, a lot of the hourly pricing rates in the summer, um, you know, have increased. Um, so I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, and I can't really say if it's temporary. Um, from what I've seen, it's starting to go down a bit. Um, but I don't know if I can actually recommend a certain avenue for you to take. Um, I will say that if you ended up canceling with hourly pricing, that you could not re-enroll for, for 12 months. But after that 12-month period, you could and roll again. Um, so if you were considering that, just know that. Um, and if you had any other questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Great, thank you. That That's helpful to know that there would be that one year before they could re-enroll. Uh, yeah, so just a reminder that the Q&A is open if you have any additional questions. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, 
Cynthia, you said, you know, that there's this push towards, well, lots of different uh, more sustainable energy sources, but uh, with with the push towards solar, if someone was interested in solar panels, uh, probably not until next spring or so, uh, but, but where would be a first place to, to go for that? Uh, if, if they were interested in, in putting solar panels on their home. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a resource that I always love to direct people to, and I don't have the link readily available, but it's the Illinois Solar Energy Association webpage. Um, they have a great resource in which is actually, you can actually look up um, any sort of vendors within your area. So they have a residential installer directory uh, where you can actually put in your address and it'll pop up um, a list of vendors that are you know close to you in proximity. Um, and I would start there when it comes to looking for vendors. Um, but at Cub, we always say that it's really uh, important that you actually shop around. So don't just go with the first vendor you get a quote from, but rather you know actually get quotes from maybe three to four different offers um, and you know compare that way. It's hard for me to say this is what you should be paying for solar because it's actually dependent on the size of your system, you know your load, how much um, you're going to generate, and like your energy efficiency and all of that. So there's not one standard cost that I could say, this is what you should pay, but rather if you're getting quotes from other companies, then you can kind of um, get a better estimate that way and you can compare them yourself. Um, if you have any questions about going solar, I also field um, the hotline um, questions pertaining to solar. So if you call that hotline number and you had a question specific to that, you would transfer for me to me. So um, just Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see any other questions right now, but you did uh, forward to me a, a lot of different contact information and some of those fact sheets and such, and I will be sending those out uh, to everyone who registered for the program. So you will be seeing that email later tonight. If you're watching the recording of this program, Cynthia so generously allowed us to record this uh, so that, especially as the weather gets actually colder, I'm sure a lot of people will be taking a look at the recording. And if you would like those contact links, uh, just email me at ce at wheatonlibrary.org. That's ce for community engagement at wheatonlibrary.org, and I would be happy to send out those links uh, to contact Cub and also some of those great fact tips, tip sheets and things to you. So again, thank you so much for being here tonight, Cynthia. We really appreciated uh, you providing all this great information for us. Uh, thanks to all of our attendees, and we hope that everybody stays uh, warm and healthy this winter. Uh, happy holidays to everyone. We hope to see you again soon. Good night.